So now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our featured speaker for Entering a New Era, Expansion and Growth of Augmented Reality. Graham Haggerty is Director of the Advanced Media Lab, an innovative maker lab-like lab space at Northern Arizona University focused on utilizing advanced technologies to make science digestible and memorable to the general public. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Graham. How's everyone doing? I definitely gave you a little bit of a tongue twister there. <laughs> All right, well, yes, I'm Graham Haggerty. I'm coming from Northern Arizona University. And to put the Advanced Media Lab into a bit more simple terms, because since that was a bit of a mouthful, is that essentially we strive to find the newest and greatest technologies, and we figure out how we can utilize those in research and education to help progress the university as a whole. So in the Media Lab, we work with many researchers, including some from Lowell. Uh, if you guys step outside when you guys are leaving here, there's going to be actually a museum exhibit that me, along with some of my students, were able to create last semester. Amongst creating digital touch exhibits, we also work with virtual reality. And the reason why we're all here, augmented reality. So utilizing digital technologies to communicate education. So what is augmented reality? Does anyone have any experience with augmented reality in here? Oh, so this will be a good topic for us. So the most simple version is playing Pokemon Go. There's, <laughs> there's definitely an older generation here, so I'm not sure if many people will get it, but Pokemon Go is essentially a mobile app where you can walk across the country, the world, and your phone like vibrates, and you can catch different little digital creatures throughout the world. So this is like the most simplistic version of augmented reality, and we'll kind of touch on this in a little bit. But augmented reality is overlaying digital graphics onto the real world to enhance. No. No. So, as you can tell, I'm getting used to this public speaking thing, so I'll bumble my way through, but we'll. <laughs> um, so has any of you guys seen Iron Man before? All right, so yeah, superhero movies, basically, as you can see, they're overlaying graphics through the real world, and it's mainly to relay information and different <laughs> um, um, all right, so augmented reality enhancing the real world. So to put this an example, out at Meteor Crater, it's this, incredible, it's this incredible event that happened millions and millions of years ago and has a wonderful museum to go with it. But how augmented reality could help advance and progress this is by utilizing these glasses that are overlaying graphics on the world. You can walk around the rim and you can have a seamless museum exhibit that is actually out, like out with the crater. So you'd be seeing the crater, seeing the trajectory of the meteor and how it all goes. So these are one of the augmented reality headsets. This is the HoloLens 2. So we're making bounds and leap, but we're still early in the technological phases. Because as of right now, this isn't the most stylish thing. I feel like most of you guys wouldn't be wearing this around. But we're, we're greatly getting closer and closer to creating augmented reality that's going to fit a bit more into a pair of sunglasses. And this is something that most of us have on our heads right now. And this is something that we can utilize going in the future. The hardest part about taking going from a larger headset like this to something like this is we have all the processing power being done on the headset. So basically a little computer telling us exactly what we're seeing in the glasses. And Apple is coming out with a brand new set of augmented reality next month or uh, next year and how they're going to bring it down to a slimmer size is all of us have essentially supercomputers in our pockets um, and so they're going to be creating a low low latency link between your smartphone and your glasses to overlay the or overlay the graphics so before i dive deeper into augmented reality I want to touch base on virtual reality and kind of so we can take a look at what the differences are. Virtual reality is a fully immersive environment. So you're putting on a headset that blocks off the world completely and creates a simulated environment instead. There's a lot of great applications for this. And at the university, I've been working with virtual reality for seven years, worked with many scientists. We created 
um, teaching chemistry and virtual reality, created quite a few experiences to kind of help people with PTSD as well as tendinitis. But one of the big limitations when it comes to virtual reality is it completely immerses you. So you can't wear it out in the world. It's not a day-to-day -day application. And with that being said, there are many applications when it comes to training simulators. And so in the military and different technical worlds, as well as the medical world, they're utilizing, augment, or utilizing virtual reality to train with high-tech tools before people actually get their hands on them. Because there's a $100 million piece of equipment, it's hard to let somebody jump in it and hopefully not break it. So augmented reality can create the full simulation where they get in, learn what it's about going on. So this is uh, virtual reality in the medical industry, being able to kind of simulate different tools and techniques. So for example, say you created a new stent valve and you're on the engineers, you can actually create a virtual experience for them to like go in, put it in and see how it works. So, this, so the doctors can know, know exactly how they do it before going into their actual procedures. But like being said, virtual reality has its limitations. It blocks you off from the real world where augmented reality enhances it. So for augmented reality, you can be walking through a city, exploring, seeing all the different like coffee shops. You can have a guy that goes to the city. You can have different messages pop up from your phone. You're basically giving all the capabilities of your smartphone, but seamlessly integrated into the real world. So I would like us to take a second to think about all the technology we use in our everyday lives. That's including our smartphones, our computers, even the iPods we used a couple years ago. Once you think about that, I want to put yourself in the shoes of someone 10, 20, 50 years ago and think about how inconceivable some of this technology we have today would be. And so that's kind of where we're at right now, going into augmented reality. So we're taking kind of from what used to be inconceivable and going into the future. And so it's going to have to, we have to kind of open our minds to kind of the almost think about it as a sci-fi thing to fully grasp the capabilities of it. To put this in example, our phones in our pockets are 120 million times more powerful than the computers used to put the first humans on the moon in the Apollo mission. So theoretically, that means your phone that we take for granted, Googling how to get to McDonald's, ordering food online, um, could like theoretically run 120 million moon missions. And so just by thinking about that, it really goes to show you how inconceivable the technology we have today would be to someone back then. And so that's how we kind of need to think about it going into the future. So augmented reality when it comes to industries as a whole, it's projected to be a $600 billion industry by 2030. And amongst many of the applications, one of the big ones is gonna be in manufacturing, you know, cause that's where a lot of the money is. Um, in particular, giving, in particular, giving all the assembly line workers augmented reality headsets that can seamlessly educate, train, uh, educate, train, and produce seamless quality control elements as they're going down the line. So what this means is you can take an employee that's working on, let's say, Toyota Corollas in the morning, and they're assembling the transmission, and you can take that and you can move them into working on Tacomas in the afternoon, assembling brakes. And so what this means is you can move employees throughout the industry seamlessly uh, without having to retrain them. Alrighty, so going to augmented reality in the medical industry. So one of the big pluses for augmented reality is it has cameras that can give a first person perspective of what the, what the doctor or the user is seeing. And so how this can be useful in many rural towns around the country and just hospitals as a whole, they don't have the resources to have experts in every element of the business. And so with augmented reality, you can have a expert or professional from another side of the country seamlessly see what you're viewing in the first perspective. And how this could be useful is you're not having to get a camera in there and do all that stuff, as well as the, the specialist on the other side of the country can ping and draw into the real space. And so what that means is you can draw a circle around a certain element and it'll stay in the space as I walk around, as I come back. And so this can be useful to get people to get a closer look and kind of help guide them through the surgery or answer any questions. So a sim the similar applications will be utilized for 
um, large engineering structures and ships and stuff like that. Because some of these massive oil rigs, tankers, and military ships are such a large thing to build. It takes so many years to construct them that every single one of them ends up being unique. And so with each one being unique, you really do need an expert for each and individual ship. Same thing with the augmented reality, by having people be able to seamlessly stream in and view what you're seeing, you don't have those bumbles and those questions where it's just like, did you say it was a right valve or a left valve or blah, blah, blah. They're actually seeing what they're seeing and they can fast their like, break down, figure out what, uh, what the issue is and get it fixed faster. Um, then diving into augmented reality when it comes to closing the language barrier. So the language barrier is essentially two people that don't aren't speaking the same language. And it's, you know, we have the we have the technology to be able to record them and look at it on the phones, but it's not necessarily the smoothest thing. With augmented reality, you're able to look someone, keep looking someone in the eye, and you essentially get little um, subtitles come up next to them as you're talking to them in a different language. And so you can kind of help bridge the gap. So you guys can be speaking a different language and then I could be getting the English translation right next to it. And so I'm still engaged in the conversation and I'm still talking. This can also be utilized in education where, where people can have the headset on and start speaking to native languages and learning the languages that way. So this brings me to AR in education. And this is kind of what I am the most passionate about, working at the university, as well as having the background that I do. So growing up, I found out that I was dyslexic from a very young age. And that's partly why <laughs> this speech is such a bumbling mess, because I try to look at my notes and they're swimming around. And I guess that's not normal. Um, <laughs> and so it kind of ties it back to where the education system growing up, like it's not necessarily kind to everybody's how everybody learns, since everyone learns differently. And a lot of times when you just have to read a textbook and take a test, read a textbook, take notes and take a test, people like me that can't retain information through reading like other people, we just end up feeling dumb and isolated. And I'm sure everyone here has felt isolated at a certain point in time, and it's not necessarily super fun. And it's not any of the teacher's fault. The teachers are absolutely like wonderful. It's just the inherent issues with some, just teaching one style of education. And so with that being said, when I learned about augmented reality and how we can seamlessly add graphics to information, this kind of opened up the opportunity to, oh, well, we can start bringing in visual elements, interactable elements, the elements that I learned best from. Because it wasn't until college that I realized that, you know, you don't have to do well on a test to be intelligent. Intelligence comes in so many different shapes and sizes, just like us. And so that's when I really dove into the graphic design world and diving into augmented reality and learning that when it comes to visual things, that's where I flourish. And that's where I really wanna help utilize that to bridge the gap with many people like me, as well as just, we're always looking for that aha moment in school and when you're teaching stuff. And sometimes text doesn't always do it. So when we're utilizing these 3D graphics and these animations, sometimes it can help make the bridge. And I want to be really clear, the educational system, like it's been built on like so many different years and like it is proven to work. i just want to utilize AR as a tool to help reach the visual audience as well. So we're not reinventing education or reinventing the textbook, we're just adding to it. So one of my big ideas and one of the big things that I'm working at with the Northern Arizona University is creating textbooks that have QR codes within them. I passed out a QR code to all of you guys. I don't know, have, has everyone used a QR code before? There's a bit more white hair in here than I expected, so <laughs> we'll see. Um, does everybody have a smartphone? All righty, I want you to just pull your smartphone out and just turn your camera on and scan that QR code. And then you click on the link. So what this does is you don't need super high tech, fancy headsets to visualize augmented reality and have it start changing the world. Obviously, it's super nice. It is amazing to have that on, and we'll go over that later and to be able to see that. But even right now, you can scan a QR code, and you can have a 3D model with an animation pop up and really explain what you're learning about. So we're working on doing this with chemistry, where you're working through a chemistry book. You can scan something, and you can have a molecule come up. Because I don't know if you, any of you guys remember OCHEM, but the chair flip animation made no sense on paper. But as soon as I saw it in a 3D animation, it made total sense. And so. 
um, really kind of driving with that mentality of utilizing graphics to help yeah, build up and increase the education. Um, so I'll click it right here just so everyone can kind of see if it's not working on your phone, but this is the QR code that you have. And so just by scanning it, you can get a cross section of a piston and kind of how it works. And this is a very simple animation, but when you're just reading about something, looking at diagrams, this will kind of catch your attention. And the other big thing is when it comes to the new generation, which I, I'm not, I'm part of it, so I can't put all the blame on them, but it takes a lot more to catch our interest and keep them engaged in class. There's many times when I'm teaching at NAU where, you know, it's so easy to look at your phone and get distracted. A practical application that I yeah. just realized something really happy to me recently. My wife broke her foot and she had to buy a scooter with a little scooter yeah. and a wheel on it. Oh, yeah. Well, it arrived in a box and I took it out. And yeah. I spent so much time trying to see because I couldn't, I yeah. Exactly. And that kind of ties it back to when I was talking about the uh, manufacturing industry as a whole. You explained it much better than I did. But yeah, so it's basically you're giving people the exact instructions they need to assemble something. So you can have absolutely no experience come in and assemble a car. And that is such a powerful tool when it comes to that. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the next one. We're going to start diving a bit more into questions in a second. I got a couple more. Let's see. Um, so amongst creating these interactable textbooks, and the really cool part about those is they can actually go home with people, get people, oh, students more interested to interact with them. But you can also use augmented reality, and this is more along the lines of the headset, to work in a classroom. So if all students have a headset on, we can be viewing the same 3D model, and the professor can be interacting with it and showing it in many different ways. One of the big drawing factors for this and something that we're deploying at Northern Arizona University is a vert or augmented reality anatomy program. So 20 students in a room will all have the headsets on and the professor will kind of walk through and they can take apart different layers, highlight different bones, muscle groups, stuff like that. And it's really incredible because same thing with when you add in motion, when you bend it, you can really see the tensions that are happening in your muscle. That is really when you start to understand. And the big reason why we're driving into the anatomy side of this first is um, cadaver labs. Cadaver labs are incredibly, incredibly expensive. And that is not something that we can replace because they need that experience. But by giving them a full augmented reality experience on the, before they dive into that class, so then they know exactly where the muscles are, exactly where the bones are, and really know the body inside and out. So then when they go to the cadaver lab, they get the most out of it. So another one of the big elements with the, uh, with the advanced media lab is combining researchers and scientists with new technologies. And augmented reality is an incredible way to engage interest in the community. Because a scientist can do some absolutely incredible research, but if it just ends up in a 500 page paper that no one ends up reading, like it is incredible research and it is needed, but we need to make that gap and make the public aware of it. And so then that's where augmented reality can start doing that just like you guys saw on your phone. Now, when you go out and you scan something or you're at a museum and you scan something, you can have an interactive view of what, they're, what they wanted you to show. And so we've done this with multiple projects. We made it a geology scavenger hunt around Flagstaff. So you'd go around and you would scan different buildings and you would figure out what the rocks that made them up and all that stuff. And so engaging students that way. Um, another big one that we're working on is I do a lot with reconstruction of paleo foliage. Uh, so I look at a bunch of fossils and I create 3D reconstructions of that. And with this, you can now put that in a virtual space so people can walk around and explore it, as well as start to populate out an entire forest. And so you can really start to look at, oh, what did these places look like in those times? And that is how we can kind of start incorporating them into yeah, like museums or even at the home. And that brings me to kind of um, one of the main points is when you're creating these digital networks using augmented reality and virtual reality, 
you're not just making it for Flagstaff or for NAU or for whatever organization you're working for. Whenever you create it, you're creating something that can de be deployed on a global network. So all the research, all the work can be utilized across the world and people can dip into those resources and learn from them. Another one of the big elements that I'm really passionate about, which we're working at the university, is doing 3D scans of artifacts in different structures. So I went down to Belize to work on some Mayan ruins, as well as working with other professors around the school. And we're starting to 3D scan all these artifacts and creating a digital database. That now, imagine you're teaching anthropology class and you can have students pull out their phones and take a closer look at what the artifacts you're looking at. They can zoom in, they can look around, they can really realize those minute details because we grab every little bit and piece. As well as you can do larger and larger structures, incorporate them into museums so you can see like, oh, what was it? And then you can also show change over time with this digital world. So we can show what it looks like today, and then we can actually show what it looks like you know, in its prime, because it's a very different thing. A lot of times when we're looking at a lot of these ruins, you kind of start to like, you just think that's how it was, or you know, oh, you don't realize like, oh, some of these Mayan ruins were painted beautifully red, and they stood out of the forest like no other, but you just don't realize that. And so being able to kind of see that go back in time in the real, the real goal of augmented reality would be if you could walk through those sites and you could toggle it on and see what it would look like and then toggle it off and then see what it looks like in the reality. Um, so kind of overall, the general conclusion for augmented reality is we're reaching many more, we wanna create a greater outreach utilizing this technology, create a visual and interactive learning style for students that can get implemented into the university, as well as it's going to be a multi-billion dollar industry and we're all going to have a part of it whether we like it or not i know it looks like some sci-fi black mirror stuff but it's around the corner it's going to be here and i think it's going to do more good than bad so i'm very excited to see what comes of it and be a part of it um right before i'm going to answer some questions i want to give a short demo of what it actually looks like when you're wearing a headset and then i can start having some people try it while i answer questions <laughs> uh, all right, give me one second. All right. This is the true testament to my ability with technology. If I can make something work first try, even if I made the internet a little slow. Do we want to open up questions? Will I kind of show this off? So would AR, I'm repeating it for the people online. So would augmented reality replace virtual reality? And I would say definitely not. There are two tools. So virtual reality has that applications with simulations, teaching, um, kind of like entertainment, many different like kind of games and stuff like that. And it is extremely powerful. Like I utilize it a lot for, it's great to explore and be wowed away to learn something in virtual reality. But the big difference is, is virtual reality completely takes you out from the world. So you can't use it on a daily basis. You can't walk down the streets with it. You know, you're in a kind of a simulated environment and that allows you to do incredible things. When it comes to augmented reality, we can't, we can't block off the entire. Uh, so when it comes to augmented reality, we can't block off the um, entire world. So we're utilizing graphics to help assist the world and like kind of elevate it. Exactly. So virtual reality has kind of, so virtual reality has a projected revenue of $450 billion as an industry by 2030, where augmented reality has a projected revenue of 600 billion. And uh, virtual reality has been around for years now. And so virtual reality, it's kind of has found its niche and has a lot of good applications, but you're right with augmented reality. Um, but you're right with augmented reality, actually, this is what's going to make world. Yeah, this is what's going to be the new smartphone in your pocket. This is what every CEO is going to want to implement into their company because by making it easier and cheaper to train people by having qual like quality control, because another cool part about the headsets, it's constantly scanning the environment. So it knows where the, it knows where your hands are. It knows where the structure are. It can identify pieces and stuff like that. So it can be performing um, quality control checks as parts are floating down the factory line. So before it even leaves the line, it um it knows if it's right or wrong. VR, um, has a 
has there been much development as far as progressing? Or seven years of that that you've been in the business as far as the job is? Uh, yeah, like really. Yeah. And no, so yeah, so virtual reality has come a long ways in the past seven years. And so I started developing with virtual reality seven years ago at Northern Arizona University. And it was essentially a brick that was attached to almost a supercomputer and could barely compute the most simple project. So just in seven years, it went from that to creating a completely mobile headset for $300 that is a completely consumer product that can be taken like around the world and you can, you know, bring it anywhere. That was not the case seven years ago. And that's kind of where we're at with augmented reality. This is clunky, it's expensive, and it's not the most practical, but this is the beginning of what is to come. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me, here, I'll answer this while I pull up this application. Right. What's your question? <laughs> uh, it's really weird working in the um, the lab I work in like students just walk in and I'm just like messing around in space and at first it really weirded them out but now it just becomes like this normal thing they're like oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, very similar to very similar to what you would like consider with your normal smart. Um, so yes, you do need the internet to download applications and stuff like that. But like your smartphone, once you have an application downloaded, you can utilize it off of the internet. So it's going to be very much so kind of building off of what your smartphone can currently do. Yes. So that's so the uh, augmented reality tracking is through a mixture of LIDAR and infrared scanning. So it's basically sending out little lasers that bounce off of stuff and coming back. Kind of like echo sonar location for bats, but so this is all built into the headset. So it's all bounce, going out, bouncing back. And that's how I can actually start interacting with um, the object in this space. So as you guys can see on the screen, here's kind of a little demo of what a potentially an anatomy course could be. And kind of like what I was talking about the power of is one thing just to like overlay graphics in front of you like if this is all it was there's just graphics in front of you like this wouldn't be that different than your smartphone there wouldn't really be much use of it but utilizing the lidar it actually places it in space so now i can walk around the model i can get a closer look if i want a cross section you know you can get nice and close and so by having it um, being able to placed in space that's the real power of augmented reality so then we can go through yeah and so you can kind of see the different muscle groups. You can do that. The full program that we deployed at the university, you can highlight different muscles, see the different motions, and go with that. And we're still trying to develop more through that. So what I want to do now is I would like to get a volunteer to come up and toss the headset on while I answer a couple more uh, questions. <laughs> very software driven. Yeah. Well, you might have to back up a little. So the question is: is the hardware is going to be dr driving forwards, and that's definitely going to be happening? But the software, how is the software going to catch up to it? Um, so yes, many, pretty much every single large company that's in the tech industry is developing for augmented reality. And we're in a really unique situation. And this is why I'm working and educating the people at the university about, because if they have experience designing for augmented reality and creating the XR, the user interface for it, there's gonna be thousands of jobs for them waiting. And a big reason why is web design is relatively solved. Like, you know, everyone knows how the internet works. You scroll through, you click that, all that stuff. Now, when you're putting it into a 3D space, that all goes out the window. So now we're completely redesigning and doing that. And when I'm developing for it, it's very much so like when I developed for virtual reality at the beginning, where it's clunky, there's not much support, and you're learning. And as it goes along, a lot more of that, um, a lot more of that becomes readily available. There's more open source code, um, and 
more and more companies can get involved. So yeah, all the big companies are working on this. Apple is going to be releasing one in the next year. This is Microsoft's. They're going to be coming out with a new one. Yeah, so this one's the Microsoft HoloLens. Yeah, I think, was there a question over here? I know. <laughs> all right. So they're they're actually not. I'm sure that they are going after it, but the primarily dominant companies are actually going to be the ones that are kind of running the smartphone world. So Apple, Samsung, Microsoft, like the big super tech companies, those are the ones that are going to be driving it. <laughs> All right, let me grab this. Let's grab someone else. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right. We got the, I'm a sucker for kids. I'm going to do a couple of kids and then we'll, <laughs> uh, I'm a, yeah, I'm a ski coach up on the mountain. So I work with the kids a lot. Yeah. You know, I toss this on. So one more thing that you can do is when you're looking at it, if you look at your palm, you can scroll through the different experiences. So let's try to do that real quick. Hold out your palm in front of you, palm up. And then now with your other hand, click the arrow. Yeah. And now look behind you and the, the model should be behind you. So walk over here and then back up there. So now if you look at your hand, you should be able to scroll through. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions from online or more questions in the crowd? Any way that you're adapting or adapting anything for people who are visually impaired? Not blind, but visually impaired. Hmm. That is actually really intriguing. I really hope so. I don't know the answer to that, but um, I'm sure that's something that everyone's working on and I hope they build towards because that could be a really incredible thing. Oh, yeah, you just got my brain spinning because imagine if someone's visually and they can kind of see but not completely, maybe the headset scans the environment and they really it brightens all the obstacles so it's easier to go through. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was trying to draw everyone's attention to when you know, augmenter, we are at the cusp of it. And so like, not everything is solved. And so like, we have to be thinking, we have to be innovating. We have to like, nothing's off the table. Like we have to think of it as a sci-fi movie going forwards and like really open our minds and kind of bring the inner child out in us. Oh, first is a comment then a question. The comment is it should be so great for safety on campus mm -hmm. because the students running around staring at their phones or walking in front of cars. <laughs> it'll be so much better they can actually look out at the world and see the screens. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about the future when this comes in. It reminds me of the early days of parallel computing and people could build this kind of hardware and it was there. No need to have a program. Mm -hmm. It took an awful long time for that to develop. And I can see in this, okay, the technology is there, but who is doing the images? Who yeah. is generating? I was seeing yeah. skeletons yeah. and things. Yeah. It's like, okay, yeah. uh, who is yeah. doing that? Yeah. Where does it come from? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, no. there's an awful lot of work no. to be no. able yeah. to populate yeah. the world with these things. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. So the question is, is um, we understand how hardware kind of progresses, but how is the software elements progressing? And how, uh, how is the industry developing and creating new methods to work with this? Um, and so a big answer to that is uh, video game development. That's kind of what started it all. I know, yeah, so video games as a whole created something back in the day called real-time rendering. And so that's basically rendering a digital environment multiple times every second. So for the most part, it's 30, 60, 100 frames a second. This creates many challenges in comparison to film, where film, you can spend days rendering one frame. In game development, you have to render 30 frames in a second. So there's many challenges with that. And so with that kind of being the initial start of it, that's where, <laughs> that's where um, all the 3D modeling comes from, all of that stuff. And so because of video games, all this is possible. So that was the brainchild. So now they're real, we're realizing that these real-time rendering engines are more powerful than just an entertainment tool. So we're taking them, we're incorporating them into architecture, engineering, all of these headsets run off of it because since it is a space, you're putting 3D models around in the real world. And that is exactly what's happening in video game development. So a lot of the same applications for that are being utilized for this. So we're basically turning the real world into a video game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. And then you want to poke your finger into it. So really, uh, you want to physically touch it. 
Yeah. While he's doing that, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's the whole. Yeah. 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 So, so many of you guys are probably from the generation because I heard it from my mom of like, uh, don't sit too close to the TV. And now look at what we're doing. <laughs> Is this going to enhance the what the heads up navigation and the other things that you can do? Aircraft and. Yeah. So yes, I think augmented reality will enhance like the heads up display for aircraft as well as vehicles. And that kind of brings me to another point where augmented reality is combining the real world with graphics. And so you don't necessarily need to have a headset on. You can actually overlay a lot of those graphics into the glass of the vehicle or the airplane and stuff like that. So that is definitely something that's coming and we're gonna see it sooner than we think. Yeah. I was a bus driver, so yeah. Nice yeah. Snow, yeah. Like. Nice with the volume of snow, and then if the vehicle also utilized the lidar technology, it could give you an early warning of if there was somebody, like a deer, a human, or someone crossing the road that you could avoid. <laughs> yeah. Is there a problem with disorientation? I know with virtual reality, yeah. people just can't see yeah. it. Yeah. I would say that's a yeah. Is yeah. Something, something similar yeah. would happen. No. So that is a huge element. So. Um, Repeat the question. Thank you for reminding. <laughs> so unlike, so the question is, does augmented reality uh, create dizzying or nauseating effects? Or um, so unlike virtual reality, that did create many issues with you know people not feeling like not feeling stable, dizzy, and falling down in it. But the big pro about the augmented reality is you're still in the real world, so you have all everything around you is still grounding you in reality. The reason why virtual reality created motion sickness and stuff like that was partly in store to um, the machines not being powerful enough to render. So our brains process the world in such a high frame rate that when we started viewing the world in 30 frames a second, you can actually see it and it created jitters. And so then that's actually what started creating motion sickness. So even virtual reality nowadays is so much better than the start because it has a lot more capabilities and stuff like that. But I would say augmented reality, since you do see you know, the reality around you, it doesn't give you any motion sickness and it does ground you. But it really does sound like you're the next one or you're, you're going to have to try it. <laughs> you got to have to see it somehow. How many frames a second does the brain go? I would have to give that a Google. Uh, <laughs> but it's... it's uh, yeah. So 75 to 120 is when you start to not realizing it. So then I think 120 and above is when you can. I think the brain can actually detect up to 240, but after that, it starts getting more and more minuscule. And because that actually is a huge, has a lot of relevance in esports with the monitor's refresh rate, because it gives you the faster reaction time and um, able to respond that way. Now let's grab a question back here. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. Um, so all that is capable. So yes, this one is static, but it is constantly scanning your hands. So everything is interactable. After this one, I will switch the um, demo to something slightly different. So you guys can see some interactable elements. The reality is that since it is such new technology, all like a lot of the major um, resources are kept to like, close to the researchers like hearts. So um, it's going to be more and more relevant. But yes, like all of this is 3D. It can all be interactable. You can pick it apart. You can, we created one where you can actually co like connect um, chemistry molecules together. And when you get one right, it's like, bing, and then it'll show you the animation all right in front of you. So we're taking kind of like the kid I grew up to, grew up with building molecules with my dad, and now we can actually create them in a space, share it with other people, and then it has seamless animations um, to go along with it. Um, yeah, let me switch to one where we can, do you want to see the uh, anatomy one or do you want to try an interactable one? Okay, yeah. I just wanted to give a comment about the visual system, the eyes, Trying to digitize, digitize something which is purely analog. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's you know the analog process doesn't work in the frame rate at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, 
I think, that, yeah, that is a good point. The brain is an analog process and we can never compare it to it with our frame rates. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess I'm curious, I wanna put this, I wanna ask a question for you guys. Augmented reality has so many different capabilities. I can't think of them all. So kind of like the visually impaired one, like, do you think about it? Like, what do you guys think? Does anyone have any ideas of like, what could be possible with augmented reality? Yeah. So, um, the image. So, so right now the question is: Is can the um, image be projected right into the retina? That is something that is being worked on. There are some that are out there that exists. Um, right now, they're a massive machine that <laughs> takes up half of a room. Um, but these versions, they are just displaying on glass. So, I think that is something that's coming in the future. I think that would be yeah, an incredible way to potentially get vision or at least potentially be able to give you like um, um, utilizing the scanning, give vibration like indications to kind of help you understand the surrounding. Let's go over here. Yeah, so another kind of or the question. Yep, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the question is, is can this be designed to show if someone's hurt or has a broken bone or something like that? Inherently, we're not at the point where it could just scan and be like, like, <laughs> oh, you have a broken arm. And you're like, no, I don't. Um, but what it can do is kind of help organize and deploy people in the EMS industry. And so especially for like, you know, mass events where you're covering massive amounts of ground avalanche search and stuff like that, you can have somebody from your base drawing out like areas for your team to search. And so everyone can have it. Now I can physically see, I can go up to this line and I can follow my search and I can do all that work right there without kind of breaking past it. And so it's a way to kind of help designate stuff like that. Then if there's something that found, so there's a point of interest, somebody remotely can actually ping that location and then people can see it on the glasses and go towards it. So I think not necessarily, I think it's a good way to like ping if people are in need. So if there's like, if you have something you can ping and be like, you know, a distress button and it can correlate to this and it can show the location in real time. Like that could be an incredible thing. Like I do a lot of um, backcountry skiing and avalanches are an incredibly dangerous, um, incredibly dangerous thing that we have to deal with every day. Just to think of, we could carry something on our chest where if we do get buried, it can turn on and basically just creates a beam out of the ground that I can see and I can run towards and save my buddy. Like those are the kind of applications where I think it would be incredible. And if we were injured, it would also like assist me and help me, right? Hey, Graham, so we're getting close to yeah. and I know you want to have people a chance to come and try yeah. it. I could go outside and keep doing a couple of demos. Okay, yeah. Um, cool. Wrap up the questions and then do you want to set it up so that people can spend a few minutes for just trying them out? Yeah, that okay. sounds perfect. So I'm going to grab your microphone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Graham. Uh, I think that was a really interesting talk. Seems like you guys all really enjoyed it too. Mr.